the first lesson in integral calculus. Notice here, real people go this way, but calculus people go this way. So today, join me on an adventure in this direction. Okay, the agenda today is to introduce uh, what are called antiderivatives and integrals. We have done derivative or differential calculus, but now we're looking at what is called integral calculus. We're going to study today the basic rules of integration. This is a huge idea. What we do today is the foundation of this entire unit and every application we will study will require you to master these skills, so let's do our best. Let's begin with a flashback. It's difficult to talk about integral calculus without talking about differential calculus. So let's go all the way back to the beginning of calculus when we had basic functions and we talked about what is the derivative of those functions. As you may remember, when you have a basic function like this with a power, we take a derivative like this. That power value, the exponent drops down in front, there it is, and then the exponent value is decreased by one. So the next one would be 5x to the fourth. And the last one here would be 28x to the 27th. So these are the functions, these are the derivatives of those, and that rule was called the power rule because we're dealing with an exponent or a power. The power rule, you may remember, looks like this. We have a function with some power n to find the derivative. Remember this symbol for derivative here, f primed. We drop that n to the front, drop the power to the front, and we decrease the power by one. That was the power rule. And we're only looking at this rule today because the power rule is the thing that's connected to the, some basic rules of integration we will learn today. So let's look at the uh, power rule for a few more examples because these are some tougher ones that we looked at that you may need to help you with your work today. So given each function, find the derivative. Here's a function f of x like this. Let's find the derivative. So again, you're going to drop that power in front. But now there's a constant in front, sorry, or a coefficient in front. So that power will multiply the coefficient, right? So we have three times that one third, and then the power here has dropped by one. Now three times one third, as you know, should cancel because it becomes one. So we just have x squared. So again, that three went here, multiplied that, that became one, and this became x to the second power. All right, that's uh, what you do when you have a coefficient. Let's look at function g of x. Now the x is in the denominator of this fraction. As you may remember, when we have a variable in the denominator, we can bring it to the top of the fraction like this. So the 5 remained in the bottom, but that x to the 7th power jumped to the top and became a negative exponent. So now we have a form of this function where we can take the derivative. So g primed, or the derivative, would be you take that negative 7, you drop it to the front, we still have our two-fifths fraction here. And then the exponent didn't become 6. It became negative 8 because, remember, you always have to subtract 1 from this exponent. So negative 7 subtract 1 is negative 8. This can all kind of combine into this. This negative 7 times 2 is 14. There's a negative sign there in front. The 5 is there. The x to the negative 8 also dropped to the bottom of the fraction because, again, we don't want to keep negative exponents. We're going to rewrite it like this. Hope this is jogging your memory. Let's look at one more. We have function h of x, and it is the fourth root of x. This one, again, we should change to a different form before taking the derivative. As you may remember, when you have roots, they become exponents like this. So we have a fourth root. It becomes an exponent of 1 to the fourth. Now we can take the derivative. I'm going to uh, remind you of the other notation for derivative instead of writing it like this, we can write it like this, dh, so we put this here, dh over dx. So the derivative is, uh, we're going to drop that exponent to the front, so there's the 1 quarter, then we're going to subtract 1 from here, and when you subtract 1 from 1 quarter, you get negative 3 quarters. That can be rewritten like this, again, we don't want the negative, so we bring that to the denominator with the 4. That 4 and now has been joined by all this. This, however, the 3 quarters fraction 
tells you it's going to be a root as well. So there's the three because it's a third power. And then the four on the bottom tells you it's going to be a fourth root. So just talk about those with your uh, partners if you need. That was just a reminder of some basic power rule applications. We'll need those skills today as we move on. So let's take some notes. Uh, you've been provided with a notes page about integration. Let's, uh, let's go to that now. OK, introduction to integration. The reverse of finding a derivative is known as finding an antiderivative. That word makes sense. Uh, antiderivative is the reverse operation. So for example, we have this function here. To take the derivative, it would become this. Again, by power rule, that 2 would drop down here, and we have 2t, and that exponent would be 1, so just 2t. And if you remember, when we just have just a variable, it becomes 1. So that derivative is that. Now, if somebody gave you this and said, find the antiderivative, that process would take you back to the original function. So derivative takes you this way, antiderivative takes you back. So remember, antiderivatives are the opposite of differentiation or opposite of finding derivatives. So let's take a look at these. What would be the antiderivative of each of the following? So here's a function, the antiderivative. So in your head, you're thinking, what would I begin with and then take a derivative of that to get this? So let me show you this. This is x squared. If you took the derivative of that, that 2 would go in front, and you'd have 2x. So that would take you there. So if the derivative of this takes you this way, then the antiderivative of this takes you this way. So start thinking now, what would be a rule for that? How would you go from this to this? Because we already know the derivative going from here to here. But how would you go from here to here? Well, instead of uh, subtracting an exponent, right, you'd be adding one, right? It grows. Instead of decreasing the exponent, it's growing. But also, I want to introduce some, another idea here before we look at the actual rules. This antiderivative should actually be written like this. It has this C here. And we'll talk about what this C means right here. So why, why does this C include it in the antiderivative? Here's an example of another function. I mean, or the same function as this. So we have f of x equals this. Let's say you had to find the derivative of that. Well, I just showed you the derivative of that would be 2x. So that makes sense. That means the antiderivative of this could be this. But let's say we had another function, g of x, that looked like this. What would be the derivative of this? The derivative of that would be 2x as well, because that 2 would drop down here, and you have 2x. And if you remember, derivative of a constant is just nothing. So the derivative of this is 2x. So it turns out that the derivative of this function is 2x, and also the derivative of this one is 2x. And actually, there will be an infinite number of functions that look like this. You could have plus any number here. And they would all produce the same derivative. So that's why when we do the antiderivative of 2x, we say it is this. Because the original could have been any function x squared plus whatever, right? x squared plus any number could have produced. So we, we account for that. We say we recognize there's some unknown constant that could have been there that we'll never know what it is here. But it, it was there. And it can be any number. OK, so let's find the antiderivative of each of these. And then you will create a general rule. So I'll help you get started in a couple. Then you'll check if you can do a few more and then see if that can lead you to the rule. So let's try this one, this one here, antiderivative of that. Again, if this was a derivative problem, you would just drop the 2 down and decrease this by 1. But we're not doing derivative. We're going the opposite direction. So instead of decreasing this exponent, it should increase. So let me show you the antiderivative. It is this. So the exponent has increased. And we'll talk about what to do with this 3 in a moment. But basically, when you look at this, the way to check if it's correct is take the derivative of this, and if it brings you back to that, and you know this is the proper antiderivative. So what's the derivative of this? Well, you would drop the 3 down, and this would become a 2. So it matches. So if the derivative takes you this way, then the antiderivative goes this way, and it works. So how about the next one? Hopefully you got that. Again, we increase this exponent by 1, and we have the antiderivative. And having that 4 there helps, because as you notice, if you took the derivative, dropped the 4 down, there's that 4, this becomes 3. So that works. The next one. 
find the next one. All right, there's obviously a pattern here. And clearly, I've chosen these very specific coefficients in front to make this work. So this one's going to be a little bit different. What's going to happen here? There's no number in front. You do know you're going to have to increase that to x squared. But will that work? If you just wrote x squared, would that then, going backwards, recreate this? Think about how you can get rid of that, that number. So think about this for a moment. Let's see what you come up with. OK, so here it is. This one may have been tougher to figure out, but hopefully some of you did. Uh, this is the antiderivative. Think about this now. If you take the derivative of this, you would drop that 2 in front. And that 2 would then multiply by this half and cancel away. And that's what we have here. We have just an x. We don't have any numbers in front of it. So that 2 cancels this half. And this becomes just x. And there it is. So how about this one? What would you do here? All right. I hope you came up with that. Uh, as you notice, this has to go up by 1. So there's the, the 3. But you needed some number in front because, again, if you took the derivative here, that 3 would jump to the front and it would multiply by this number here and, and become 1 because there's just a 1 in front of the x squared. So I hope you were able to come up with this fraction here. That fraction needs to be there for the antiderivative to work, right? Because that will multiply by that. So now try this one. All right, so after doing a few, I hope you got the pattern there. But basically, there it is. If you drop this 4 in front, if you took the derivative of this, that 4 would go in front. It would cancel away with that 1 quarter, and we have x to the cubed, and there it is. So now, what's the general rule? If you have x to some power n, could you write a rule here using n uh, for finding the antiderivative? All right, there is our rule. This is a fundamental rule of integrals. We won't learn that many rules of integrals. This is a key one that will take us through the whole unit. So just take a look and make sure you really understand all these examples and how it led to this important rule here of integration. All right, the rules basically are going to add one to the exponent here and then multiply by a fraction with one over whatever that number is. OK, so let's take a look at this one. So what would be the antiderivative of this? All right, hopefully you got that. By the rule, we're supposed to add one here and then include a fraction in front that is 1 over whatever we've added here. Because now, if you did a derivative of this, that would cancel away that fraction. And don't forget to see why c, again, we talked about this, but I'll show it with this example. If you had this function, that the derivative of that would be x to the 10, because that 11 would cancel that. That would become x to the 10th. That 4 becomes 0. So there's that. But we could have an, another function that has the same beginning part, another constant value, and that would also have the same derivative. So again, that's why we have the c. Next one. How about this one? This one's going to be a little tougher, probably. In this case, hopefully you noticed you have to do that rule about bringing that up like that. Now you can look at this and use our integration rule. And there's our integral plus c. This, In this case, right, we um, added 1 to here. But when you add 1 to here now, it becomes negative 4. And by the same rule, we put a fraction in front, and this became negative 4. Therefore, we have a fraction with negative 4 on the bottom. But the negative can be written here. Now think about taking the derivative of that, negative 4 multiplied in front here, it would cancel all that, and then this would become negative 5. So we're back to here. So the derivative of that would bring us back to this. And this can be simplified into this, right? This should go in the denominator. And final one is this one. Don't forget, we should rewrite it like this. Now use the rule of integration should become this. This one's a little trickier, but again, the rule is add 1 to here. So that means add 4 over 4, which becomes 7 over 4, and then throw a fraction in front that has 1 over whatever this exponent is. So there it is, plus c. That can be rewritten like this, because when you have this strange fraction here, it can become this. Now practice. Try these problems in your notebook. And uh, in the second video, there's going to be a second video, we will begin by looking at the answers to these. We'll see how you did.